Good morning and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, my name is Faisal Chowdhury. Uh, I'm the uh, member of the Scottish Parliament, uh, also the chair of the cross-party group of Bangladesh. Uh, we are gathered here uh, today uh, for the 19th Festival of Politics. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, the urgency of climate change and justice in vulnerable, low-lying countries ahead of COP28, parallel in partnership with CPG Bangladesh. There is no question uh, that climate change is happening at unprecedented uh, rates. Our modern uh, lifestyles are uh, unsustainable and are impacting uh, the vulnerable nations in an uh, unimaginable way. Uh, earlier this year, the CPG on Bangladesh addressed uh, in a meeting the uh, climate emergency, uh, if global warming raises by 1.5 cent uh, centigrade, low-lying nations have been pleading their cases to the international country for years. The damage will be uh, irreparable. Uh, uh, if no action is taken now, uh, these are the, the dilemmas we, uh, we are here to uh, address today. Um, I want to first start by uh, introducing Dr. Liz Crisp. Uh, Senior Lecturer in Political uh, Theory at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, her most recent book is titled What Climate Justice Means and Why We Should Care. Uh, then we have Ben Wilson, uh, uh, the Advocacy Manager uh, at the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund. Uh, uh, Ben told me he's a doctor as well, he's done PhD, so uh, he didn't put it in his title uh, in case someone uh, asked him to do some research, so you never know, we might be doing that later on today. Uh, 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 then I have Jelena Rohman, uh, who is a solicitor, uh, um, practice at JR Solicitors in Glasgow, uh, specialist in human rights, uh, family and immigration uh, legal advice. Uh, Finally, we have Professor Salim Hawk. I hope uh, he's <coughs> online with us, is he? Um, recent, uh, we've been struggling, uh, but uh, I'm sure. Uh, Nibal, do we have Professor Salim Hawk here? Yeah? If you want to give it to you. Uh, uh, who will be joining us live? Uh, sadly, uh, we, uh, we're going to have uh, the High Commissioner of Bangladesh, but. Uh, had an emergency this morning, so uh, apologies from her. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is to set the scene and make you all uh, uh, have something, a food for thought, is I'm going to ask a question. Uh, that will be to, uh, of course, uh, towards my panel. Same time, uh, if any of you want to get in, uh, I, I will be happy to listen to you. Uh, uh, the, there will be an opportunity uh, for uh, the audience to get involved and ask questions. But of course, before that, I, um, uh, I will be uh, wanting to get the, uh, the, the presentation from, from my panel. Uh, COP26 took place in Glasgow almost two years ago. Uh, many promises and uh, goals were made and set. In few words, what do you think the biggest achievement since then and we were, have we fallen short? So the, the, my question to all, all of you is that uh, I have been attending a lot of events in Glasgow uh, during COP26 with my team and I have met uh, uh, officials from uh, Africa, from Asia uh, and I've heard the stories, the, the, the horror stories from them, and I know the difficulty uh, their country is going to be facing. And what they have been telling me is that uh, the COP's been happening 
but they cannot see any changes, all the promises. So my question to all of you and to the panel. So first of all, uh, I would like to now ask Dr. Elizabeth Cresp to uh, start your presentation at the same time the, the question I've already asked. If you can touch on that too, please. So um, I think globally it's encouraging, it's important that we have, um, so from a mitigation point of view, but there is a new administration in Brazil. I think that's going to make a very big difference in, in terms of, of mitigation. Um, from a loss and damage adaptation point of view, obviously the loss and damage fund that was agreed at um, COP27 is, is hugely important. Um, more locally, um, the commitment that Scotland has made um, as part of that is, is deeply important. Um, I think it shows leadership. Um, and I actually also find it very encouraging that there has been a rise in climate activism. So obviously it's discouraging, which is still needed, but the fact that more and more citizens are recognising this is, is fundamentally important. But um, we're still a long way behind. We're far behind on both mitigation and adaptation. If you think about the nationally determined contributions, the commitments that states have made um, through the, the Paris framework to commit to reduce their, their carbon emissions, we're still behind on reaching um, um, achieving a, a limiting rise to 1.5 degrees C on that, let alone the actual policies that have been put in place. We're still seeing new coal, oil, gas pro projects going ahead, and that's despite the International Energy Agency having said that we just cannot have any more of these projects if we're going to um, achieve net zero. Um, in the UK, we still don't know what's going to happen with Rosebank, even though that is, is just incompatible with, with leadership on, on climate change. And we need a lot more commitment um, globally in terms of loss and damage. That needs a huge amount more funding. So why, uh, why do you think uh, the, 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 the global action has been slow? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the, even after all the pleading for the Lord uh, Nations, so where do, where, do, where do you think where do you think we're lacking on? So I, yes, as you rightly say, the, the the countries and the communities that are most impacted by climate change have been saying for a very long time that we need action, including low lying states, small island states, and I think. The, the sort of quick answer is because the people who have the decision-making power aren't listening to them. So climate change is an injustice in a huge number of ways. It's an injustice because human rights are being violated, people are losing their homes, their lives, their health, their livelihood because of climate change. It's a distributional injustice because if you look at the people who are benefiting from, from the processes that cause climate change, they're not the ones who are paying the costs. But it's also a participatory injustice because we're all entitled to a say in the decisions that determine how we can live our lives, especially when it comes to something as fundamental as this, which determines you know, whether we can live a healthy life at all going forward. And if you think about the way in which decisions are made about climate, whether we're talking at a national or a global level, it's not necessarily those who are most impacted who actually have a say. So if you, if you think with, even within states, it tends to be more marginalised communities, often indigenous communities who feel the effects most and they tend to be underrepresented at decision making. And in terms of the global process, what, what's needed for this to be just would be a really transparent, representative process where the most vulnerable communities, um, often poorer states, actually have a real meaningful seat at the decision-making table with equal, um, perhaps even, even entitled to more weight in decision-making. But what actually happens is that we have a, a process of diplomatic negotiations. It's very far from transparent. A lot of it happens kind of behind closed doors. And it tends to be the richer states who walk away with the decisions in their favour. And that's, that's not just. And I think it's also worth pointing out that actually the, the corporations, the fossil fuel companies, have a disproportionate say in decision making. So if we think about the, um, the 2022 Conference of Parties, the oil and gas companies had more than 600 representatives at the negotiations. So that was more than twice 
the representation, the delegation of indigenous communities. So we're talking here about the corporations who are essentially doing the damage, having much more influence, presence at these key international negotiations than the frontline communities, the marginalized groups who actually have most at stake here, who are losing their homes and livelihoods. If we look forward to the next COP, the, the president is the head of an oil company. That doesn't look like participatory justice to me, and I think that, that's your explanation. That's why they haven't been, haven't been listened to in terms of decision-making. Thank you, Dr. May. Next question. Yeah. Uh, climate change is currently the centre to human rights-related uh, discussion. For low-lying countries such as Bangladesh, uh, the climate emergency uh, has uh, 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 pentered uh, issues across the economy and agriculture, uh, creating uh, inequalities of food, water and uh, sanitization. How can we approach uh, climate change as a human rights issue? So I think you're absolutely right, this is a human rights issue and I think it, it can actually be very helpful to put it in those terms. I mean as a moral philosopher I don't think we have to, we can just say this is a matter of serious harm. But human rights is, is an idea, has kind of international recognition, it's recognised in international law. And I think if we put it in these terms it reminds us of what's really going on here. Some people rich people, rich countries and institutions are acting in a way which is killing other people. We don't like saying it like that, but that's the bottom line. And I think it, we need to recognise that. If we, if we recognise this as a human rights violation that it, that it is, then we can kind of get in before rich countries start crying unfairness and saying they shouldn't have to do anything at all or say that contributing to loss and damage is a matter of charity or something superrogatory. If we put it in those terms, it reminds us that this is actually a basic injustice that we're talking about here. And these, they're not controversial human rights, right? We're talking here about life, we're talking about food, we're talking about health, we're talking about shelter. We're talking about the kind of rock bottom basics that we owe each other as human beings. So it's, it's, if we're going to have any human rights at all, we should have the rights to these things. We should certainly have the right not to be deprived of them by the action of other people and institutions. So I think equally uncontroversially we can say, well, there's a lot of complex debates about what exactly it would mean for our global institutions or our countries to be just but we can say they are unjust if they are violating people's human rights rather than protecting them. And that's what's happening with climate change. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to start here, recognise that, and then we can say this shouldn't be a matter, matter of kind of party politics, which it's become in a lot of countries, certainly in the US, even to some extent in the UK. This shouldn't be about your political ideology. This is about, you know, basic human rights, matter of fundamental justice and then it should just go straight to the top of the global agenda. Thank you. My last question to yourself is uh, countries that contributed the least to the climate change are the ones that are now being largely affected by climate changes. Uh, devastating impacts. So uh, is it better to character uh, climate justice as a moral obligation or a political responsibility of the West? So I think it's both. Um, I mean, the bottom line is, as I said, that this isn't political in being a matter of it's, you know, what political ideology you happen to have, whether you should think this is important, but it's something that political institutions have a fundamental responsibility to do because it's about basic justice and it's also about basic morality. And I think, I think you're, you point to a really important fact, which, which we touched on before, which is that these human rights violations, they're not happening at random. They're happening to communities who have already been marginalised, who are often the victims of past injustices. So we're talking about indigenous communities, communities of colour, we're often talking about women who feel more of the effects of climate change than men. Um, and we, so that's why activists tend to say, well, look, this is about the climate justice, it's also about race justice, it's also about gender justice, it's about kind of recognising that these harms they, they, they affect different people much, much worse than others. And we see that at the global level as well. Um, we've seen, obviously, significant impacts already, even in richer countries, so wildfires in California and Australia. We've seen um, floods in, in the UK, but 
that's not to the extent that they've already seen the impact in countries like, like Bangladesh, who have been suffering with the effects of this for, for, for decades and have been already having to deal with it, um, and who have le done least to cause it. So the carbon emissions of, of Bangladesh, I looked them up this morning, the carbon footprint in 2021 was 0.55 tonnes per person compared with 5.15 here. So we, we're in the situation where in the West, we should be doing this because our governments are responsible for a lot of these harms. They're responsible for enabling the fossil fuel companies, often by subsidising fossil fuel that have caused them, and continuing to do that despite clear warnings of scientists, of the International Energy Agency and so on. But I think we should also say, well, we should be doing this anyway because we have a basic moral responsibility to each other as human beings to protect each other's human rights. So even if in the West we weren't responsible for these harms, which we are, we should be doing this because we can. We are the ones with the resources and ability. That doesn't mean that we should be making all the decisions. I think quite the reverse is true. It should be the, the countries and the communities who are worst impacted, who are listened to here, who make decisions. But we should be prepared to put up the money. We should be prepared to change our way of life. And we should be prepared to set the, the, the tough net zero goals and actually to stick to them. I think the, the, thanks for that answer, but I think what we, uh, we are hearing is that the, the countries, the poorer countries who contribute less to the climate change are getting highlighted and affected most. But whereas the richer nations uh, contribute a big number, but they're not uh, getting mentioned anywhere. Or uh, uh, I, th I think the, the message is that the, 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 the richer country should be characterized and should be paying for, yeah. for it more than the, 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 the poorer countries. <laughs> and that's, what's your opinion on that one? Do you think uh, that they should be identified as well? I think it's, yeah, I mean, as a, as a, as a moral philosopher, it's pretty clear cut here. I mean, whether you look at the fact that it's the richer countries who are more responsible for harm, or you look at the fact that we have benefited most from climate change, or you look at the fact that, that we are in a position to pay these costs without suffering ourselves, which is not the case for, for poorer countries, all of those just kind of coalesce in saying it should be rich countries in the global north, countries like this one, who should be prepared to bear the costs. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Crisp. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the audience will have an opportunity to ask you questions later on, but uh, now I'm going to uh, turn on to Ben, uh, Dr. Ben Wilson. Uh, doctor, uh, uh, obviously I, I did ask an opening question where, I mean, if you want to start with that, then I'll go to my second question. So, I mean, on the question of what progress we've made since COP26, I think um, I would be being generous to say it's a mixed bag. I mean, on one side, in terms of mitigation, reducing our emissions to, to tackle climate change, it's been terrible. And there's, in particular, there's been huge failures on fossil fuels. So COP26, believe it or not, the 26th meeting of the COP um, was the first to explicitly mention the F word, fossil fuels, in the decision text. And they did it in a really weak way. So the, the reference to fossil fuels in the decision text was to phase down, not to phase out, but to phase down unabated coal and inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, leaving really the door open for people to continue subsidising fossil fuels on the basis that they are efficient, not inefficient. And we saw that language repeated again at COP27. So there's been huge failures. But I would say on the positive side, I was there in COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh and uh, left that COP for the first time ever. It was my fourth or fifth COP I've attended for the first time ever with a feeling of positivity. And that was about the agreement to establish the fund on loss and damage. Because although that fund, the details of which have not been agreed yet, there's no money in that fund yet, it touched on something really fundamental. It got to the heart of the injustice of climate change and gives a little bit of hope that when the countries, in particular the countries of the Global South, working together with civil society across the world, that when they come together that they can sort of make a breakthrough on these big crux issues like that. And we really hope for significant process, progress on loss and damage at COP28. Thank you. My first question to you is, uh, with a multi-level structure of climate governance, how can uh, local and uh, regional actors be uh, supported and best engaged in the decisions-making process? Thank you. That's, it's a, a really interesting question and a very difficult one. I, I, I received the question in advance and I was thinking about it a lot last night. I mean, this, 
I think the way that I would I would answer this is that I mean when you think about climate change, it's often ve it feels very big and very far away. You know, so when you talk about the science, for example, you know that people will talk about 1.5 degrees or two degrees, and you know it, it feels kind of alien and, and foreign and, and big and far away and kind of hard to to grapple with. But also the politics of climate change is really far away and hard to grapple with. Like that example that I just gave now of phased down, unabated coal and inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. What does that actually mean to regular people? Um, it might not mean very much. But in the space of climate diplomacy at the global level, at the COP, it means a great deal and it's very important. And people stay up all night long <coughs> arguing over this word or that word in the final decision text on the basis that that actually does then trickle down through every level of climate governance um, to actually mean something for regular people. So, um, and then alongside that, I suppose I would say that there's a real moral principle there um, around subsidiarity. That's what, what we as my organisation is, is informed by Catholic social teaching, and this is a very important concept to Catholic social teaching, um, because it's based on the idea that the decisions Decisions should be taken at as local a level as possible. You know, it should be, they should be taken as close to the people as possible. Now, sometimes decisions do need to be made at the global level, sometimes the national level, and sometimes at the local level. But you need to really get that right, and that's about achieving good outcomes. But that's also about a moral priority, making sure that people have authority to decide their own lives. And so, the question relating to multi layers levels of governance and climate change to me is is actually sounds very technical, but it comes down to something very fundamental, that climate change and the responses to climate change need to work for people. They need to be understood by people and the experiences that they have of climate change, and that those people need to have the, um, the means and the information and the ability to shape those interventions as much as possible, to make sure that it really works for them and it means something to them, be that changing your behaviours, uh, which is a priority here, in countries like Scotland, or be that um, adapting to the impacts of climate change, which is a real priority for people in countries like Bangladesh. Thank you. Uh, should there be an uh, accountability measure put in place for countries failing to meet the climate adaptation uh, requirements? I mean, yes, uh, so the, it's absolutely um, vital that there are accountability um, measures in place. Um, there are some. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about them, and, and I think that they need to, to be better and to be stronger. But I suppose I might finish my response to this question with a bit of a question to the audience, because basically, so the, we have the Paris Agreement now, right? And so the way that the Paris Agreement is enforced, it's, it's, a, it's a nationally determined process. So it's not top down. The, the Kyoto Protocol, which was um, predates the Paris Agreement, was top down, and a number of countries weren't happy about that, especially the US, and it was kind of doomed to fail from the beginning as a result of that lack of support. So the Paris Agreement is bottom up. And so that means that there's a general agreement about what needs to happen. So we need to reduce global average temperatures within the two degrees or ideally the 1.5 degree limit. That's an agreement. There's also a global goal on adaptation. We've not actually agreed what that means yet. Maybe Salim will talk a bit more about that later. But there is a goal on that. And then now we're starting to see more agreements on, on loss and damage. But the way that countries then are expected to say how they are meeting that global agreement is, is up to them. It's a nationally determined process. So they will submit their nationally determined contributions every five years. They submit adaptation communications. And there's a particular obligation under Paris for countries like the UK and others to, to provide finance and means of implementation and capacity building and technology to the Global South to help them to grow low carbon economies and adapt to and recover from the impacts of climate change. But the only accountability measure really when people are, when countries are submitting their nationally determined contributions and they're not good enough, which is what we're seeing now, there isn't really a mechanism. There's no fine, you know, they don't have any financial incentive to meet it. Um, there is no uh, sort of legal restrictions because, again, it's this nationally determined process. So the Paris Agreement relies upon peer pressure between states, relies on diplomatic processes, um, it relies on this kind of soft notion that at least countries will be brought together by some sort of common endeavour. They will have their own self-interest, but they should at least have some sense of of common endeavour which will lead them to do what they need to do in order to meet those global agreements. There are ways that that can improve, that, that transparency and accountability process, and, and we need to do that. That's by like agreeing really strict rules you know, on what 
you need to put in your nationally determined contributions. We can do that. That might help with the accountability process. Transparency is another big thing. You know, you, having a uniform way of reporting your greenhouse gas emissions and reporting your progress towards adaptation. These are really important things, and then there needs to be some more progress on transparency and on having common rules, etc., in order to really make sure that that soft accountability process can work. But just to conclude, I suppose I would say that it is failing. I mean, the, the, the nationally determined contributions which countries had to bring is to COP26, actually, by 2020, the initial date for COP26, were not good enough to get us on track to the, uh, the agreed uh, goals of the Paris Agreement. We will see more nationally determined contributions submitted in 2025, and this year there's what's called the global stock take to take stock on where we're at. And that is going to conclude that we are not on track. It is not working. And so I suppose the question I would pose to the audience, because I don't know the answer, maybe my fellow panellists do, maybe Salim does, he knows most things, um, is you know, how can we make this system more robust so that it actually functions? Because at the moment it is not quite functioning as it should. Thank you. I hope we can get Salim uh, back on last as well. Oh, he's with us. But, uh, I'm not coming to you yet. Uh, but um, uh, my last question to uh, you is, how should responsibility for loss and damage be shared among uh, developed nations in order to move uh, towards the climate justice? So, yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. So, as, as many of you will know already, as has been mentioned before, the Loss and Damage Fund was established at COP27. Um, there's talks going on right now about what exactly that fund will look like, and they will make the transitional committee in charge of that will make recommendations to COP28 and hopefully get that fund up and running. But the amount um, of money needed and who's actually going to meet that cost has uh, not been decided, and again, will be... Uh, uh, subject to tense discussions and I have a great fear that it will not, in fact a strong expectation that the level of finance required for that fund will not be reached quickly, but hopefully we will get some progress towards it. In terms of how um, that money should be divided up between countries um, who are responsible for this, I mean there's a few different approaches. There's one approach which is quite interesting, um, it's really been focused on mitigation in recent years, is the fair shares approach. Uh, so a number of organisations support this, which basically looks at the remaining um, atmospheric space to emit more carbon into the atmosphere. It looks at the historical amount of carbon that countries have emitted, and it looks at uh, the capacity of that country to act and the right of that country to develop, especially relevant to countries in the Global South. And then it makes a calculation based on that, um, how much more um, it would be fair for a particular country to emit into the atmosphere. And, and this calculation says that the UK needs to reach um, net zero, not by 2050, its current target, but by 2030, and pay a trillion dollars to invest in the reduction of emissions in countries outside of the UK, especially in the Global South and that that would be the UK's fair share. So obviously we're getting astronomical terms here. In terms of loss and damage specifically, um, there, it's quite difficult to, to put a particular number on how much money is kind of owed for this issue, because to do that you would have to calculate the difference between a sort of normal extreme weather events which would happen without climate change, the intensity and frequency of those extreme weather events uh, as a result of climate change, and then the difference between them and what the economic cost of that is. So it's kind of hard to do that calculation, but the, um, some organisations are coalescing around a figure of $400 um, billion per year for the loss and damage fund. Now, you might remember there's a $100 billion a year target, which already exists, and that's for re emissions reductions and for adaptation, for mitigation and for adaptation, and that's not been met. So this $400 billion a year goal um, is indeed ambitious, and yet it is exactly what is owed, we could say. So um, in terms of how it should be divided up, um, well, you could use a fair shares approach, I guess, with the Paris Agreement and the way that it operates, as I've suggested before, it would more likely be nationally determined. And therefore, um, it would be, the onus would be on countries in the Global North to decide how much they would commit to that. Separate to that, though, there is a lot of work happening at the moment um, on possible international mechanisms to raise money towards this target. So international 
um, uh, shipping and aviation levies, um, financial transaction tax, which has been sort of talked about um, certainly uh, by NGOs and activists for a lot of years, um, maybe debt swaps. You know, there's a whole number of different financial options at the global level as well as within national budgets, which could be explored to fund that loss and damage fund. But um, again, I suppose I'll just wrap up. I mean, it does kind of leave me feeling um, a bit hopeless. You know, we've failed to reach that 100 billion a year target, which was set in 2009. In 2009, Hillary Clinton first started talking about this. And they were supposed to meet it by 2020. It was a big thing. UK government were dying to meet that target by <coughs> COP26 in Glasgow, and they couldn't do it. And then they still haven't done it, and maybe they'll get there next year, but it's still made up mostly of loans, not grants. And yet we know that that is not even nearly enough and there's going to be a huge, bigger, huge, a much bigger bill for loss and damage coming down the line that needs to be met. So it's a challenge, but I suppose it should be a challenge to all of us as people who are interested in this issue, for academics and politicians and everyone else who's working on it to sort of strengthen our resolve. Because the only way it will happen, and we agree that it should happen, is with us being active and calling on our political leaders to do the right thing and to, to build the world which is based on justice rather than the current one, which is shaped so much by injustice. Thank you, Dr. Ben. I mean, you've said in your last answer that uh, the, the UK have a target as well. Do you think uh, we are in, uh, in line with the target at the moment? Or if, if we are not, what do you think uh, we, we, we need to do or what we can do to put pressure? So, the, I mean, the, the UK target, uh, I'm actually not up to speed on, on where they're at. Um, the Scottish target is stronger and they've missed eight out of the last 12. So Scottish Government have missed eight out of the last 12 annual targets on their climate change reductions. There is a new climate change plan um, due to be published by the end of this year from the Scottish Government. And it's really important, I think, if we're going to get that, we, OK, we, we need technological um, advancements, we need innovation, um, we need investment, all of that stuff. But I think fundamentally what we need here is political will and political drive and ambition. We've seen, as, as Les mentioned before, how green policies are becoming political football in the UK between Labour and, and, and the Conservatives, especially in the Uxbridge by-election, which many of you might have seen. We cannot allow that to happen in Scotland. We need to, all of us, collectively show that this is something which polls well, which it does. It's something which is good for our economy, it's good for our health, it's better to have a greener country. And ultimately, it's something that, that we will support the government to take the bold steps that they need to take in order to, to get to those targets. I did promise you that I won't be asking you difficult questions <laughs> or political questions, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure audience, audience didn't. But uh, uh, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, next, I'm going to go on to uh, Jelena uh, Barlow Rahman, who is a solicitor, uh, plus uh, have a uh, Bangladeshi background uh, and uh, quite a lot of family members uh, still. Uh, living in Bangladesh and will be affected uh, with, the, uh, with the climate change happening. And I do have uh, the, the, the Consul General of India here as well. Recently, India went through a uh, flood. So obviously, I will uh, give you an opportunity to say a few things uh, at the end. Thank you. Uh, the, my first question to yourself, uh, Jelena, is, of course, the, 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 the very first question I asked uh, everyone. If you want to uh, say a few things on that one before I, I go to the questions I have lined up for you. Thank you, Faisal. Um, I think I concur with what my uh, fellow panellists have already said, but what I want to touch upon is a lot of people think, why COP? Why do we need it? And for me, it's a, a venue, a place, an international forum, an international think tank. And I do believe that having COP, it has encouraged um, companies uh, to look at themselves. And the, the beauty of it is, is hitting globally and you have the media, you have the social media, people are tweeting about it. And so it has created, as um, Liz has already uh, pointed out, a climate activist, are, um, for, you know, it's a rise in climate activists. And I think that's extremely important because you have the younger generation rising up and the younger generation have a right to rise up because it's about their future and um, that is a uh, that is why I think it needs to continue some people think that it's just um, a lot of uh, heads of state coming together and leaving but I do believe whilst it's a little um, progress for some people might say it's little progress but you have to understand these are there are a lot of chiefs 
coming together here. A lot of chiefs making decisions and a lot of uh, people showing their uh, you know, heads of power and everybody wants to make decisions. And so yes, there will be um, slow progress, but there is progress and I truly believe there is. Also, in terms of my area of uh, the law, I've seen a lot of litigation. There are uh, claimant uh, actions that have been raised by individuals against huge oil companies, and um, that there's been law, legal uh, precedents being set in many different countries against big oil companies, and that must continue. And that can only continue when the forums like the COP allows us to come together and share ideas and um, put the ideas together and tell people what is happening and what case law is going on and that can only be done in that setting so I do think it's a positive uh, a venue and I will speak positive about it as well as there are negatives it is slow it could uh, it could be faster yes there was talks in um, COP27 and now finally we have uh, the the loss and damage uh, being determined and we have issues now and who is going to determine the amount that Ben has already been touched upon and then you have the additional issue of who's going to manage this money, where's this money going to go, which bank accounts is going to go, who's, how are we going to set up trustees, I mean this is huge, huge, you know, this is going to be, what, another year, who's going to be leading, who's going to be um, analysing the money, who's going to count the money, um, so whilst funds might go into an account there'll be a lot of people wanting to have access um, to it and a lot of world leaders will want to have access to it so all these things need to be ironed out so um, and i hope they are ironed out soon thank you uh, the first question to yourself is uh, it is estimated that with just a one meter raise in the sea level uh, around 15 million people in bangladesh would be affected and 30% of the country's total land mass would be underwater. Uh, are the international community uh, prepared to take on this level of climate-related migrations? Okay, so I'll first off start off, I am a human rights lawyer and I call a lefty lawyer as the conservative Suella Breverman calls me. Okay, that's what I am, right? Uh, <laughs> So I've been um, uh, I, uh, in immigration asylum lawyer for 20 years. I've seen war-torn, you know, asylum seekers coming from war-torn countries. I've seen the impacts of this. So I'll start off with giving a bit of background to Bangladesh and what we're talking about Bangladesh here. Um, I mean, Bangladesh is a country where climate change is not an abstract notion. The effects are already there and they, the impact of climate change is visible. So whilst countries, while we can sit here, um, Kushti, as we uh, hear in uh, the UK and other countries, um, countries like Bangladesh, they're already seeing the impact of uh, climate change. And just to go from the, give a bit of history, and I apologize if I'm uh, saying things that you already know, but as we know from the Industrial Revolution, it started off at 1.1 and rise to 1.3 degrees. And this is called the, caused by the historical polluters. And who are his historical polluters? Mostly the West. And so for decades, debates have been ongoing. This is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for decades and decades. And as Liz has pointed out, we have companies, um, big companies with their big fat checks being able to stop uh, the debates going further because they're able to, uh, you know, you know, they were trying to argue that this was not a human phenomenon. This was something that was just um, happening. And finally, in 2007, we had the IPCC uh, producing the fourth assessment, which finally said, this is a human phenomenon. This is created by humans and something must be done. So let's just go back to Bangladesh and the population. We have roughly 165 million people in Bangladesh at the moment, one of the most densely populated. I apologize for that, 180, but I was looking at, so 180, I'm being corrected by the audience here. And one of the most densely populated countries in the world. So what happens with migration? Once you have, um, once the coastal areas are being flooded, most people start heading to the cities. 
Now, Dhaka is hugely densely populated already, and this migration to Dhaka is having a huge effect the, on the social structure, the economic, economic structure, everything. So these are the things that are happening in Bangladesh. 400,000 people are moving on an annual basis into Dhaka. So you've got to understand, you have to put it, you know, you have to picture how many people are moving in, living in slum conditions. And again, um, uh, Liz touched upon this. This is inhumane and degrading conditions. We're talking about slum conditions. These people don't want to move. They talk about land, they, you know, had fruit trees, they had houses, they had everything. And now they've been migrated into places of a, um, a small shack where they are now all their possessions in one room and it's very difficult uh, for them. But it's not just Bangladesh. We keep thinking, oh, this is just happening in the poor countries. We've already witnessed what's happening in the USA, in Louisiana, and also in Germany, where we had the flash floods, where they thought the structural, you know, we're the West, we have the structures in place, we'll be able to cope with it. But what happened? The structures couldn't cope with um, the flash floods. And this uh, made the West realize what climate change impact was doing. And most recently, we're reading the news at the moment. We have uh, the, in Portugal, in Greece, the, uh, fire, the, um, the wildfires that have been, it's there. And people are seeing that there are dangerous level of temperature rise of 45 degrees. So the government are now finally w waking up globally, but are we too late? What, what people keep thinking is just about floods and the actual structure, but why I will explain to you what the increase of the temperature does, because I did some research and actually it shocked me after I did this research, and I'm glad to find some for allowing me to sit here and do this research. In Dhaka, it's getting hotter by 0 0.5 degrees, and there is what's called a wet bulb temperature. Now, what's a wet bulb temperature? A wet bulb temperature is where the heat and humidity, um, if it reaches 100%, a human body cannot cope. A human body shuts down. Our body can only cope with 35 degrees. And believe it or not, in Pakistan, and uh, another Arab country, which I forgot to note, it has already reached that wet bulb temperature. Because why the human body cannot cope is because it cannot cool down. Your inside body cannot cool down because of the outside, the heat and humidity. So we are facing a situation where people are going to be dying in front of us from the heat temperature. We've seen this. People are already reporting this. And this is caused by climate change. So these are the things, these are the factors we need to take into uh, consideration. And going back to the question, we need to enter into dialogue now. We need to do planning now. The topic that I'm touching upon is not a, um, most politicians want to ignore. It's not fashionable or it's not sexy, it's not something they want to touch upon. Why? Because of the rhetoric that the government have already put out there by Suella Breverman, the Home Secretary of State, calling asylum seekers and making comments about the asylum seekers and refugee crisis at the moment. So when it comes to migration and in, uh, environmental migration and refugee, environmental refugees, nobody wants to talk about that or make plans or make decisions. Why? Because it costs money. Put it into perspective, in Louisiana, there were floods and the US government made a presidented step to the federal state funded $15 million to house 100 families for the first time and relocate them. That's for 100 families. Do your calculations. It's not gonna be possible to do that for when you have a population in Bangladesh of uh, there's going to be, I think it's 11% in my notes that I have. That's uh, 15 million uh, people that will be displaced. We need to start the talks now. We need to start planning now. Politicians need to talk. And I think we all are saying the same thing. This is a global collective planning. Planning, preparation, and it needs to be started slowly by surely because it's more effective if we do it in that manner than suddenly have 
a huge rise in population of large migration shifting. And we've already seen migration shifting in Bangladesh into 400,000. And no, this is why we need to push our politicians to start agreements. I understand there are talks of agreement, but very similar to the loss and damage, it's just talks. We need to see things on paper. I mean, thank you. Uh, I mean, you know, Bangladesh uh, has given uh, uh, the shelter to Rohingyas, uh, uh, of course, bringing in extra pressure on the country. So, uh, do you think that uh, the, 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 the rich countries are supporting countries like uh, poor nations where they are giving uh, the, the, their, their home for the neighboring country? Uh, do you, uh, do, how do you think that uh, the, the, the support can be provided by the richer nations? Well, it goes, it's very difficult how to support in terms of as uh, the population increases and where Bangladesh has taken, I think it's two million Rohingyas, um, uh, refugees, uh, and they're also in camps. And this is no criticism of Bangladesh, it's a poor country that is dealing with two million refugees and they're in camps and they're doing their best and there are international aid workers and international organizations helping. But because, and it's interesting, it's because there are international aid work organizations that are taking over, it's quite easily to forget, well, they're dealing with it, we don't need to deal with it. Um, but it, it, this is something that it's, it's once again, it's coming together planning and discussing. It's very similar to what I have said earlier, that if we don't sit down and discuss a plan and a, a route of how um, this matter is going to be dealt with, we're going to end up with a very catastrophic situation. As we've heard, 180 million in a most densely populated country, it's going to cause internal civil unrest. You have to remember there are a lot of uneducated people that don't understand what's going on. And that it fuels politics, it fuels anger, it fuels, um, it fuels violence and, uh, and resources are very scarce as it is. So I think the only way that international government can help is helping with resources, helping with funds, putting infrastructure there, providing um, better sanitation, better homes, giving a better education, explaining to people what's happening. Education is key here because there's a lot of people that don't understand what is happening. Thank you. The resulting situation uh, places gender, minorities and vulnerable communities at a significantly greater risk. What can be done to mitigate this? Uh, well, having uh, worked in asylum law for 20 years, I've seen firsthand what uh, war-torn countries can do and the most uh, impacted is the most vulnerable are the women, children, and that result in human trafficking, and, um, and they're the ones that are left behind. So a lot of people question, why are the men here? Why are there so many men, male refugees, uh, thinking that this is a, just a job opportunity? It's not. It's very difficult for women to leave. The men go out uh, in front to find out because they take their lives and they know that it's a very dangerous route to flee somewhere, leaving the women behind until they find a safe route. Then they will take the women with them. And the women are left behind in a situation where they're extremely vulnerable. A majority of their children or babies, you can't uplift a family. Imagine having a baby in one arm, you're breastfeeding, you're doing a, a, a toddler. It's very, very difficult. You're only going to uh, expose yourself. And these are the ones that we need to protect. And how we need to protect them is that we do need to set up and a climate plan and I believe there are talks of that and I've read again this is allowing me to read into this that there is a structure to address uh, gender inequality but these are just plans these are just talks again um, there's data that is being collected data is very important because without data we're not going to know who uh, are being affected how they've been affected what um, resources are required and uh, the data will highlight uh, what genders are affected by the climate change and what policies can be implemented to help. As I said earlier, education. We need to educate people to make them understand and also train the government staff on the gender inclusion and climate crisis 
women, children, vulnerable, disabled, uh, elderly, all need to be included in uh, this climate change, climate change plan and what needs to be done to protect the vulnerable. Um, we need to empower these people. We need to have an empowerment program. We need to sit there and we need to plan an empowerment program to empower them somehow. And this is something, again, that will need to be uh, put into a um, paper of some sort, which can then be implemented with policies and procedures for each government that are facing this crisis. And once this uh, gender action plan is put in place, uh, we could create a gender uh, advisory committees within the government organisations to protect the vulnerable. This is the only way to do it. Go back to the local, go back to each nation, provide them with the guidelines, but work collectively, globally to do that. Sharing the data, sharing the information, providing as much as we can to protect the most vulnerable. Thank you very much. I'm looking at the time, but I do have another question for you. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, if, you, if you see the, 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 the crisis in the world, uh, UK is uh, uh, home to quite a lot of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, it, it been, uh, uh, we've been home for um, Syrians and Afghans. And, uh, but how do you think that uh, developed countries uh, can support uh, countries like Bangladesh, if, uh, the, the, especially the refugees? Do you think that the, the, these countries are uh, ready, or do you think uh, what measures should be taken? Okay. Um, in respect to the climate change question, um, Bangladesh um, has an impressive economic growth at the moment, and um, it's been backed by, by decades of systematic investment, and I think uh, Professor Hock will be touching upon that. And um, Bangladesh is actually, in my opinion, at the forefront of climate change, and it's doing, and it's been preparing for climate change. They have reduced cyclone-related deaths by a hundredfold since the uh, 1970, and today is recognised as a global leader in climate change adaptation and dis uh, disaster preparedness. Now, Bangladesh is not saying here, we want you to take 15 million refugees off our hand. No, that's not what they're saying. What Bangladesh is saying is, you need to take action against your mission. You need to do. Uh, uh, you need to assist us with adaptation. You need to assist us with loss and damage. We will deal with. If you assist us with this, we will be able to manage our country. We do not have the funds to do so. You have benefited from all the decades, uh, hundreds of years of um, industrial revolution, and we want. Uh, and we want to. You know, we yeah, take respond. You know, we want that fund. So, that they they don't need um, the the other countries to take any refugees. That's not what it's about. It's about assisting Bangladesh with um, adapt adaptation. So, how are we going to do that? There's some ideas that I know um, other countries are looking into, and I know Japan have already looked into some of the ideas. They've been talking about floating islands. They're talking about uh, architects coming in to um, have houses on stilts. Uh, they've been talking about uh, structures to help uh, the, some of the land. What Dubai, look what Dubai has done. Look at uh, reclaimed land. All that is reclaimed, the Palm Islands. People are forgetting that. That's with billions and billions of dollars. It's possible. People forget that. That's with reclaimed land. And that's just, uh, and that is possible. So it is possible. The technology, the um, ideas, the research is all out there. It's just money. Thank you very much, Nina. <laughs> Dr. Hawk, the spotlight is on you. So my first question to yourself, which I have asked every um, uh, other panelist, is that. Uh, I, I don't know if you've caught it because we didn't have you in line uh, when I asked the first question. Uh, that uh, COP26 happened in Glasgow. Uh, we are looking ahead of COP28. Have we, uh, how far have we gone? Uh, have we kept the promises we made in 26? Uh, I'm skipping 27. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward for 28. So where do you think we are? 
uh, and uh, obviously uh, the time is running out as well. So if you can make your uh, answers short as well, please. Thank you very much, Faisal, and, and apologies for joining late. I had technology problems. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, give you a bit of a reflection on uh, COP26 in Glasgow, where I had the good fortune to be there uh, with uh, uh, many of your uh, panelists. Uh, in, in, in Glasgow, we had unfortunately not a very good result in the UNFCC COP26 inside the, the venue of the COP. But I would say in contrast, when we came out of the venue, the COP venue, and we spent time in Glasgow City and in Scotland, we got a very, very different reception. And that was reflected in the fact that at that time, uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish government were the first country in the world to put forward a million pounds initially, which she then doubled to two million pounds as a new loss and damage fund, accepting the responsibility of paying reparations to the victims of climate change. She was the first leader in the whole world to make that statement and put some money on the table. Now, a million pounds or two million pounds isn't a great deal in the uh, scheme of things, but it was the first million and the first two million that any leader had given us. And it wasn't just her and her party, it was actually the people of Scotland uh, that we got tremendous amount of support from. Academics working on climate justice issues, NGOs like Ben and his uh, colleagues, working on these issues in developing countries for many, many years. And so I would say, the first thing I would say is that one of the things that is, is the most significant of COP26 is not the COP itself, but what Scotland did. Scotland stepped up on the issue of loss and damage in a way that no other country did. And you started the ball rolling. Following Scotland, we got the province of Wallonia in Belgium, put in a million euros. We got a number of philanthropies to put some money on the table. So by the time we left COP26 in Glasgow, there was about 10 million or so outside the UNFCC. The UNFCC did not make any progress, but outside it, we did make progress under Scotland's leadership. And since then, in COP27, as Ben has mentioned, we did, made a bigger breakthrough with an agreement in the UNFCC to set up a fund, and a number of other countries have committed funds. So the commitments for loss and damage funding is in the order of several hundred million outside the UNFCC at the moment, but if we have a UNFCC fund, then that will come into that fund as well. So those are major breakthroughs that Scotland should be very proud of having made. Now going forward, I think is a very important point for us to remember, which is that we have just crossed a major climate change threshold in the last month. The month of July, 2023, was the hottest month in over 100,000 years. And that is the threshold we have now crossed into impacts of human-induced climate change happening and losses and damages attributable to human-induced climate change happening at scale. In fact, I'm speaking to you from Dhaka, where we're having thunderstorms and we've had some very, very heavy rainfall in Chittagong and Coxa Bazar area. And people have been flooded and there've been a number of landslides that have killed people in the last 24 hours. And this is not normal. Uh, rains are normal, at the, the scale of the rainfall is abnormal. And it is attributable to the fact that global temperature is above 1.1, 1.2 degrees. So we have entered what the uh, Secretary General of the UN now calls climate boiling, not just climate change, but climate boiling, you know, in, in uh, a reference to the proverb of frogs uh, being boiled in uh, water very slowly so that they don't realize that they're being boiled until they die. Human beings can make a, dis a difference between that and July 2023 is a wake up call. We need to get out of the boiling pot and we need to do something. And let me conclude by saying that I think Scotland and Bangladesh, my country, we have a lot in common. We can do things together, not just leaders, but people, academics, researchers, NGOs, civil society, lawyers, there are many, many different ways in which we can collaborate with each other. And I'd be very, very happy to continue to explore how we might be able to do that. I'll stop there for now. If you want other questions, I'm yes, happy to answer. Uh, yes, Professor, I do, I do have a couple more questions for you. Uh, th thank you. Uh, 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 and uh, since you've touched on that, uh, uh, the, the commitment Scotland has done, the, the, uh, my question is, uh, Scotland has set a net zero target for 20. 
1945 and became one of the first countries, as you said, uh, in the world to introduce uh, comprehensive legislation on climate adaptation in 2019. How can other countries follow suit? Absolutely. So I think Scotland is certainly a, a global leader, both on the emission targets, which unfortunately aren't always met, as Ben has mentioned, but they are good targets and they need to be adhered to. Uh, also on adaptation, Scotland is not immune to the impacts of climate change and you're going to have to adapt. In fact, that's one area where you might even learn from Bangladesh how to adapt to the impacts of climate change because we have a lot of experience on adaptation, particularly to floods and cyclones. And then I think you know, the issue of loss and damage in my mind, now that we have crossed this threshold and entered what uh, the Secretary General calls the era of climate boiling, I call it the era of loss and damage, we have now entered, it's happening, and it's attributable to human-induced climate change. So to me, that becomes the number one responsibility of every single one of us. We have to help the victims. They did not cause the problem. We caused the problem. We are responsible we must take moral responsibility to help them. And Scotland has stepped up. You have done it. The people of Scotland have done that. And I feel that that's something that the people of Scotland, together with other vulnerable countries, particularly Bangladesh, would be very happy to collaborate to actually take this forward as a, as a global citizenry attacking the climate problem, not just waiting for leaders to do the right thing, because they have failed us time and time again. Thank you. Uh, at COP27, uh, we saw importance, uh, important progress uh, on uh, mobilizing climate adoption plans, uh, a new pledge, totaling more than 230 million US dollars. However, the, the goal for developed countries to jointly meet 100 billion US dollars by 2020 uh, for adoption was not met. How can uh, we better uh, encourage states to uh, mobilize a commitment to this scale? Well, this is happening. So one of the good uh, outcomes in Glasgow was an acknowledgement by the developed countries, the rich countries, that the funding that they were providing, the 100 billion that they promised, but were not getting to, uh, even within the amounts that they were providing, they had a very skewed uh, proportion. 80% of what they were providing was going for mitigation, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, and only 20% was going to adaptation in the most vulnerable developing countries. And that's something that all of us uh, raised there, and they acknowledged that they need to do better, and they promised to double the amount of funding that they were giving for adaptation. So to go from 20% to 40%. We had asked for 50%, but they agreed to go to 40%. And Many of them have been putting money in to do that. They haven't reached that target yet. So, you know, promises are made, but promises are not kept when it comes to money. But nevertheless, it is moving forward. Now, one of the key issues in using money, which is a very important one from our point of view, is that there has been evidence, uh, um, research done on adaptation funds that have been provided in many different countries. And one of the results of the research, which was published in the latest IPCC report, is that in many cases, the funds were given for adaptation, but they didn't actually work. They didn't result in any reduction of vulnerability. And the reason why that was so, it, it varies from place to place, but the generic reason is that these were done in a very top-down manner. The funders from, you know, the global funders arrived with their plans and they told us what to do, and then we did it and it didn't work. And they never bothered to ask us. They never bothered to ask the local people. And so what we are promoting very strongly is the notion of what we now call locally led adaptation. Listen to the people who are being impacted, whether it's in the US or in, in Scotland or in Bangladesh, doesn't matter. Local people who are being impacted know the problem. They know what should be done about the problem. And if you want to go and help them and provide them with assistance, you have to help them do what they think is best and then support them in doing it themselves rather than going and telling them now this is what you have to do particularly when you go and tell them you're going to have to move they don't want to move they want to stay where they are they want to be protected and so we are making progress it's slow it's not fast enough but we are making good progress on learning how to do adaptation more effectively and getting the funding to do that still an inadequate but at least it's moving in the right direction 
Thank you. Uh, good to hear that. Uh, but my last question to you now is, uh, how can we better ensure countries in the global south are not being locked out of access to uh, transitioning uh, to renewable energy? Well, absolutely. I think this is a key issue. In fact, you know, living in the south, in the global south, this is an internal discussion and debate within our country, Bangladesh, India, China. What is the best way for us to develop? And those of us who believe that the best way for us to develop is to use renewable, clean energy rather than the old fossil fuel, dirty energy that has been used in the past. Uh, it is still a struggle because you know the vested interests who want to invest in fossil fuel are very strong. They're very powerful, uh, both in our country as well as in the, at the global level. So we are going to have to fight them. And the best way to fight them is to show that the, it can be done and it can be cheaper. So right now, renewables are actually cheaper than coal. They will become cheaper than petroleum very quickly, and then they'll become cheaper than natural gas after that. And they are becoming cheaper by the day and better by the day and more efficient by the day. In fact, in Bangladesh, we just opened a major new renewable energy uh, uh, plant that's about 300 uh, megawatts. It's the biggest we've made so far. And we've got solar home systems in 6 million households. That's the largest number of households it's uh, solar uh, home systems in, in the whole world. So Bangladesh is actually quite progressive when it comes to renewable. But again, it's not happening fast enough. It needs to happen faster and, and uh, it needs to be supported by the global community. We need a lot more support and resources and investments to do this. Thank you, doctor. Um, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Uh, before I go to the... Uh, the, the to the floor and ask uh, uh, to the audience and uh, ask questions to my panels. Uh, I, have, I have my colleague who joined uh, me just now, uh, Sarah Boyak, who is the Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Justice Transition. Uh, she's been, uh, she visited Bangladesh twice. And uh, if you just want to uh, share few, uh, your thoughts and where we are and what can be done. Hi. Well, first of all, apologies for not being here right at the start and missing um, the start of the speeches. Um, Foisel's right, I've been to Bangladesh twice, but I've also been to Malawi twice. And I got very excited um, at COP26 because the loss and damage principle is not just a really important idea, but hopefully it will lead to more action. And we can feel proud that we kicked off the idea in Scotland but we really need to do so much more and we need to make sure that money actually gets out to those countries and gets spent. Um, because I think we need to do more on sharing knowledge and expertise and resources. And one of the things I'm going to pitch to everyone is to get involved yourselves because this is the Scottish Parliament's Festival of Politics. We're in recess, but next month, we're all going to be back and there's a chance to come and work with us in our cross-party groups. For example, we've got cross-party groups on Malawi, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Uh, I chair the International Development Cross-Party Group. And we need to make sure that climate change is actually central to everything we do in the Parliament. So it's not just a good talk but it's actually delivering and supporting groups. Um, the work that Ben's doing in his groups, we support the Disasters Emergency Committee. And there's a lot to be optimistic of. People do want to work with us. Um, when the Disasters Emergency Committee launched their Pakistan flood relief uh, fund, it just went way over their expectations. But we need to be doing this all the time. We need to get our businesses to do more. One of the things we're doing in our cross-party group is in the international development is to try and get debt cancelled for developing countries who've built up debts through no fault of their own and it stops them spending money to actually get work done in country and to pick up that comment about working with local communities. Um, so there is, there is work we can be inspired by. Um, but I think there's so much more we need to do. And there's supporting other countries and then there's doing stuff in Scotland. So we're not meeting our targets. We've got some of the most radical targets, which again, we can be proud of, but our homes, our buildings, we need to decarbonize them and do it in such a way that people can afford it. We need to decarbonize our transport and we need to decarbonize our land. And renewables was mentioned, We've helped to lead the renewables revolution. We should share our technology. 
we should do it ourselves. So there's a lot more we can do in Scotland, but also work with each other and pass on that experience, but not in a one-way direction. My lesson from going to Malawi and Bangladesh is it's not just us going to tell other countries, here's our great technology, it's actually learning from them, working with them and supporting them. So it's a pitch. Um, it's great seeing everyone in the room. Think about getting involved afterwards. I recognise a lot of people from local campaigning. We can do more if we work together, both across the parties, but also all the different networks and support all the aid organisations, whether it's financially or making the links. So I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion. My final pitch is on Friday at 3.30 p.m. we're going to be debating Scotland, a good global, good, good global citizen, question mark. So if anyone doesn't get a question in today or they don't get their question asked and they want to come and keep getting involved, that's my message. We've got to do this together because climate change is not a future issue. It's a now issue. And there are countries where people are losing their education, they're losing their jobs, they're losing their homes. And we need to do everything we can to support them recover, but also to be resilient for the future. And you know, COP26 proved we've got a responsibility, yes. Urgency ahead of COP28. What can we do together? Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, yes, uh, I think we all agree that uh, we all need to act now. Uh, things are happening. We've seen, uh, I can see uh, one of my uh, friends uh, who is the, ch uh, the, the chairman of the Turkish uh, Chamber of Commerce, who is here recently, Turkey went through uh, na natural disaster as well. Uh, same time, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Consul General from India. I think India has recently been flooded as well. So if, the, if, if there's something you want to say, uh, Consul General, uh, Vijay Solveraj, do you want to come to the front? And uh, the mic is... Thank you, MSP Faisal, uh, for having me here. Um, very briefly, you know, the experts are on stage. They've all uh, spoken. Uh, Can you switch the mobile off, please, if you don't mind? Yes, so um, as everyone said, climate change is here, and we in India uh, feel it more acutely because it's still largely an agrarian uh, society and... Um, uh, we depend a lot on the monsoons, which is from June to September. There's already been a very erratic pattern to the monsoons this year. Uh, places which normally have good rainfall have got less, and places which have less rainfall have gotten more. And this uh, analysis over each 10-year period is seeing a shift now, uh, if you take over the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, I had the, uh, uh, the pleasure to serve in Bangladesh uh, for three years from 2013 to 16. Uh, there's just one word of caution. It's um, that both India and Bangladesh are extremely ambitious countries. Uh, there is tremendous appetite for growth and uh, people want uh, economic growth and that is going to lead uh, to consumption of uh, resources. Uh, so some of the solutions that we talk of here, for example, in Scotland, uh, like, for example, uh, cycling. Uh, for various reasons, that is not going to work in India or in Bangladesh right now. Um, we need to look at other ways. And, and India is at the same time looking at other ways of, of uh, uh, reducing um, emissions. For example, uh, the amount of solar capacity installed, the amount of wind capacity installed, the number of uh, nuclear plants that have been installed and the, there are a, a few more that are being uh, commissioned. We have the ambitious target of reducing fossil fuel by half in 2030. So uh, that is an extremely ambitious target. All our oil and gas companies have been instructed by the government to look for the best ways uh, to do that. And in fact, between Scotland and India, we've, uh, uh, we've had initial discussions with companies in Aberdeen which are into green hydrogen and in that space to look at how best this can um, uh, benefit India. So uh, there is an uh, appetite for technology, for advanced technology, uh, but there's also a lot that is happening in India to mitigate uh, uh, or reduce the uh, greenhouse emissions. Uh, but as I said, you know, given the ambition levels, anyone who has traveled to India uh, uh, over the last couple of years would see that one year is not the same as the next year. The same with Dhaka. It, 
uh, what it was in the 90s as a you know uh, 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 a place where cyclones would literally wipe away thousands of people the amount of effort that's been taken to uh, uh, mitigate uh, you know human suffering when disaster strikes has been tremendous both in india and in bangladesh and i think that's something we need to acknowledge and then and not just look at it as um, an absolutely poor you know desperately in need of uh, help sort of uh, situation there's both ambition but there's also a great realization that uh, we need to do more so any any cooperation with that as the context is uh, what we're looking at thank you thank you thank you very much yes we all agree that we all <coughs> need to work together uh, now i'm going to uh, give you guys the floor so can i uh, you've raised your hand first one, two, three, four. So I'm, I will, we'll take all the questions at once, then obviously uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take the answers. And I can I ask everyone to keep the question precise, please? Yeah. Um, so my name is Bryce Kuro. I'm a disabled climate justice activist. I've got a I've lived experience of, of what's happened in Mosmore and in, in uh, Fife. And I just wanted just to basically bring the global picture to this. So I'm a disabled person. And in Bangladesh, um, approximately 10% of Bangladesh population is disabled. That's approximately around about 16.94 million people uh, who are going to be most disproportionately be affected by this. And yet we've got yet we've got basically the UK government, which you've just mentioned, Elizabeth, which I want to say thank you so much as somebody who's a spokesperson from the uh, Stop Rosebank campaign, is that we're going to, we are basically going to, the UK government are trying to prove the Rosebank oil field, which is basically, the, the emissions will equate to the low, to basically the annual CO2 emissions for the lowest 20 income countries combined. And I mean, the, the Rose Bank has been widely public op opposition, opposition of like 700 scientists, experts, tourism organisations and political parties. And I just think that when I'm looking, and, I've, and I was at COP26, and when I was hearing from people and people who have actually now gone on and actually had to get some counselling and support because of activists and indigenous communities have had to get some support and counselling because they have been so, they have been betrayed by the government, they've been betrayed by people and they just cannot, they cannot imagine the pain and suffering of, of seeing a failed system. I'd like to ask is, how can we get fossil fuel fossil fuel lobbyists out of politics? How do we get them out of politics? How do we ban MSPs, for example, from meeting fossil fuel lobbyists and actually and actually get an end in the corruption that happens in up in the back doors of politics? Because this is exactly what the problem is. Equinor has met the UK the, the Scottish government, Equ and BP has came in here and had secret talks with with MSPs, and yet. That does, that does that 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 doesn't make the that doesn't make the headlines, and yet these are the people who are apps who are given gratuities and giving all these fantastic things to MSPs and to and to also to political leaders, and that is muddy in the waters. That is causing this corruption, causing these uh, causing these agreements which we see at COP26 to be watered down and diluted, which is going to affect these 16.4 million disabled people in Bangladesh. Who are absolutely going to be the, who are going to be the forefront of this? Who are going to be absolutely going to have to basically, like, they're not going to be able to be able to migrate migrate properly. There's people with autism in uh, in that area. I've got autism. How can they be able to do that? That is absolutely abhorrent, and we need to take action now, and we need to take action right here, right now, and we need the MSPs. We need the Labour to be bold and call for a green new deal and we need and, and we and we and we need and we need to basically actually get some action on this right here right now thank you very much thank you very much for the question uh, do you want doctor do you want to answer that now or do you want to do it uh, all together um, whichever you prefer i'm happy to say something quickly now i mean i I very much agree with you and thank you for raising the fact that disabled, the disabled community is one of the, the groups who are disproportionately impacted by climate change. This is what we call an intersectional injustice, so it falls across many different groups who are already 
been um, the victims of injustice in the past and it's often those who fall into more than one who are particularly impacted. So as you say, the disabled community within a country like Bangladesh are really feeling the effects um, of climate change and often are, are kept out of decision-making process. Climate anxiety, the mental health impacts of climate change, we haven't talked about enough today, so thanks for raising that. It's incredibly important, and including among young people. Um, and I mean, I absolutely agree that there is no way that any kind of commitment to climate justice or climate action can be compatible with Rosebank. It just is impossible. Um, so, I mean, I really would like to see leadership by the Scottish and the UK governments on that and making that, that clear decision. And also completely agree, it's incompatible with any kind of participatory justice that corporations, and it is fossil fuel companies, but it's not just fossil fuel companies, it's also a lot of evidence of big meat and dairy companies influencing political decision making and trying to influence public awareness on climate change. And we do need, I mean, perhaps a, a lawyer um, or perhaps somebody with an NGO background like Ben would be better than me place to say how we do this, but it's completely clear that, that that is a huge part of the problem that this has been allowed to happen. Do you want to add anything to leave with um, Ben? I mean, maybe briefly, yeah. I mean, I, I would just, yeah, I, likewise, I mean, thank you for your, for your activism and for your commitment to the cause. I think it's absolutely necessary. We need people like you to be doing things like you're doing, but we also need, let's say, moderates or um, people who are not, um, uh, people living their everyday lives to be considering this and calling on their political leaders to be taking action on it. And we also need people like Voisel and, and Sarah to, to, to take that to the floor of Parliament, like you said, and put pressure on government to deliver results. Maybe just quickly on fossil fuels, I would say that there is a lot of momentum now growing around something called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. This is in recognition of the fact that the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC, the Convention on Climate Change, have not managed to get results on fossil fuels like I mentioned earlier. And I think uh, more growing momentum around that from activists, from moderates, from opposition politicians could be really strong in terms of really finally putting the nail in the coffin of, of fossil fuels. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Even the, you touched upon autism and people don't realise the impact that this has um, on many different um, uh, minorities. Um, I just want to say that it's down to the local and you being the activist, and I think Ben's touched upon it. Uh, the Solomon Islands, um, the president uh, of the Phoenix Island, uh, I, I saw one of his documentaries where he mentioned that whilst um, you ask other leaders to do certain things, you as a leader have to also implement things. So it's the leaders and the politicians that need to do something. And in, in that category, they were doing a lot of fishing and he implemented, um, uh, he implemented uh, sort of uh, levies on fishing to stop the number of fishes because whilst the island needed the fishing and needed the food, he stopped a lot of the fishing so that they, they could grow. So these are the things that as locals we need to do. So we need to carry on the activists and it's up to the politicians uh, here in the room that need to um, stop the, these companies coming in. They need to, they need to be open and transparency. There shouldn't be hidden talks behind closed doors. Uh, there shouldn't be extra perks. It, you know, we're supposed to be leading in this. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jelena. And uh, I totally agree. And as Ben touched on, that uh, we are here to listen. Uh, uh, my colleagues are here. Uh, we will be taking it forward as well. Uh, uh, we, as I said. Uh, people like yourself are here to make us uh, make sure that we do our job properly. Uh, we are here to listen, we are listening, and we'll make sure that we do what we have to do. Uh, and uh, I don't know if uh, Sarah wants to uh, say anything on this, or uh, uh, as, as I said, uh, whatever questions are getting asked, we're listening and we'll do whatever we can do to serve the community. Yes, I'm also a climate activist, have been for a very long time. And I'm speaking on behalf of um, the Edinburgh Climate Coalition, but also Just Stop Oil Stroke, This Is Rigged, which is now the Scottish element. The, we climate activists feel very strongly that politicians don't get it, basically, and everything's happening far too slowly, too much in what, what we're saying is, um, Politicians should be, should be serving the public 
and not the oil industry, the fossil fuel industry. That's one point. And the other point is these young activists, and I'm getting to I'm, I'm not gluing to myself, just I'm far too old, but I know these young activists very well now. They are superb people, and they're treated like yobs and, and criminals and put into jail and everything. It's much worse in England, of course, still. But you know, they, they are just so frustrated. And now with Rishi Sunak's latest pronouncement about 100 new licenses for new oil fields and gas fields, for God's sake, you know, we just feel incredibly frustrated. And the politicians are not doing nearly enough. They just haven't got it yet. I just get same old garbage from my MSP. I won't mention his name. He just says, you know, oh, SNP is doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we're all sort of bubble. In fact, the last um, Climate Change Committee report on Scotland is we are only doing well on um, renewable energy. All the other issues are not being properly dealt with. Thank you very much. I think the, 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 uh, the questions are m more similar, and I, I guess the answer would be uh, quite similar. To, and as I said, uh, that uh, we are here to listen, and we are listening. And I, I, it will be wrong for, of you to uh, put everybody in, in one line. So we, uh, there is people like us. Could I touch uh, upon <laughs> that? Sorry, could I touch <laughs> upon that? I think I understand the politicians. The difficulty is here that the politicians have a five year cycle. So they have a five-year plan. This is not a five-year plan. This is something that, and it's very difficult for people to, con you know, to sort of vision something that's going to happen in 2030, 2040, 2050. Because those are the statistics. A lot of people say that's far away. But we already see in the impacts in Bangladesh, in uh, some states in America, in Germany. You know, you're seeing it around the world. It's on the news. So politicians have to, you know come out of this box of the five-year cycle plan, what are we going to do, what can we do in, uh, in terms of um, the local, we need to, as uh, Sarah had said, we need to incorporate climate change in every single plan, in education, in the hospital, anything that you, is being done has now to be incorporated, and I think that, I think you're right, it needs think, to change. I, I it's, a, it's, it's, it's a culture of mm, politicians need to change. I think it's very clear, uh, we all need to work together, rather than pointing finger at each other, and uh, we need to work together. Because it's happening, it's, uh, something needs to be done. And we are here to listen, and we're listening. Uh, next question. Yeah, but you're, you're just saying you're listening. But the thing is this, so it's, it's, not, it's not just listening for action. And that's exactly what we're asking, what we're asking for. We're asking for climate action, because actions speak louder than words. Agreed. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Faisal. Uh, it's uh, wonderful that uh, you have bring this issue in Scottish Parliament. Uh, I am Dr. Walid Osuruddin. Uh, I am in Scotland since 1976, and I was UK in 1967. And why I'm working in my country, Bangladesh, uh, as you said, 180 million is more than 80, 180 million. We don't count the uh, the uh, what is the refugee in the uh, Bangladesh is more than nearly 15 million now. And uh, I was in Bangladesh uh, not very long, even three months ago, then I was last year. And uh, the flood in uh, Silat, as you know, more than 15 million people, such a disaster flood happened in, in Silat. Is, uh, half of the country was water. And uh, it is going very, very dangerous. As you know, the size of the Bangladesh 180 or 90 million is like Wales and uh, Scotland, England and Scotland, the size. And uh, UK is size is uh, 70 million people. And you are talking 190 million people. You have to think about the, what is, uh, Dr. Hawks mentioned. Is we are going very, very d dangerous position. And I hope that the Bangladesh should be prioritized for the climate changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Panelists, do you want to say something on that one? one more, oh, right, OK. Um, you have a question. Um, I think there was someone at the back. Sorry, we're not forgetting. We're not just going on the. I'm, I'm just going to take two more questions and uh, then. Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, as briefly as possible, uh, I'm David Coleman. I work with Scottish churches on environmental issues. I'm. Again, I don't want my comment to be taken as soft, but the language you are using suggests that we are the only species on the planet. Uh, 
Uh, at COP26, there was a lot of talk of nature-based solutions. Uh, and then the indigenous folk there called that out and said, you know, you're not listening to the voice. You're not giving rights to essentially other stakeholders in the nature and climate crisis, which I think is what we have to carry on doing it. Can you update your language a little bit if you're listening? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take one more question, then uh, I'm, I'm going to come to the panel right to the back. Right to the back over there, and then who is next in this side? Okay. Thank you. Um, is this on? Yeah. Uh, I'm a faculty member at uh, Institute for Global Health and Development at Queen Margaret University. And I had a question for the panel about framing. Uh, and this is harking back to Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything. And I just had uh, three points I was wondering about uh, quickly. Uh, should we be focusing on countries and just the oil industry, or should we be looking also at transnational corporations and how exports are being protected by the World Trade Organization? I, I haven't really heard that as part of the discussion. Similarly, someone raised economic development and economic growth. And I question, can you really, truly have the economic growth that we've seen in the West around the world without impacting on the environment and without truly impacting on sustainability? And that brings up the issue of sustainability as a, as being framed from the Brundtland Commission to the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals in a purely anthropocentric manner where we're only looking at the perpetuation of human life at, at a certain level, whereas, as the former person just mentioned, we're all really quite connected. And with that one focus on um, on uh, the, the how we look at who is to to blame or who is 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 the accountability on. I also wonder what you think about the whole resilience discourse and the fact that so much funding. I work on on resilience funding. Actually, I'm I'm doing research in Bangladesh, looking at resilience. And yet there's a part of me that also questions, by looking at resilience, are we actually taking the responsibility off of the government, the transnational corporations, and essentially placing it on the shoulders of the individuals? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm going to take one more question, then I'm going to get uh, first Ben to respond. So oh, the, the lady next. Oh, Dr. Hawk, sorry. Th thanks, Chair. Now, uh, I teach at uh, Strathclyde University. I'm in the economic department, right? Although retired now. Now, the point which you have raised, particularly Professor Salimul Haq was raising, the lead Scotland game. Scotland game, we must maintain the momentum. No doubt about it, the world is facing what you call an existential threat. For a low-lying countries like Bangladesh is a case of life and death. 41 million people are going to be displaced. So the most important thing, these countries are suffering for the irresponsible action of now the industrialized world. So they must pay the loss and damage fund, which was agreed in Sharm el Sheikh. And what we want from politicians like you Please, please give the lead. Uh, even in London, the government is uh, delaying, like, like that one, the, the sense we're getting. And the previous speaker was mentioning that one, that how do we pursue this thing? That's most important. So politicians like you, we want a, a strong lead. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got enough questions. I'm going to uh, go to the... Uh, our researcher, uh, Dr. Ben Wilson, first. <laughs> um, yeah, if we've got time, I know time is short, so I'll just be very quick. I mean, thank you for the questions. I mean, I think the point on multinational corporations is really important. Um, I think there would be definite questions over how you actually do that. But one, th one aspect of positivity is that the potential global taxes that I mentioned and the innovative sources of finance to try and draw in more money from such institutions 
uh, was actually explicitly mentioned in the COP27 text and therefore is something that's being actively considered by the Transitional Committee on Loss and Damage. That gives me some hope. I think on the point about biodiversity and ecology and anthropocentrism that sometimes dominates this debate, I think that I, I agree. However, I think that, you know, that there is you know, the, S the Sustainable Development Goals recognise this, and it is actually something that I think is perhaps inadequately, but it does inspire the SDGs and how they are framed. Um, I think there was some efforts to try and bring together the, the UNFCCC process and the Convention on Biodiversity process around COP26, and I think that probably needs strengthened. And then lastly, just to say to uh, our colleagues at the front engaged in activism, I think that the Climate Change Plan, which is forthcoming in the Scottish Government soon, is uh, something that we should all, as citizens, as activists, as people concerned about this issue, really focus our attention on, because, you know, governments um, uh, will, you know, um, respond to the cycles of policy that they have to respond to, i.e. they are producing this plan now and therefore focusing our energy on that as well as focusing absolutely on Rosebank and, and the developments and the announcements on North Sea oil and gas can really help channel all that energy towards something which hopefully, for goodness sake, can be a bit more positive than what we've seen. Thank you. Dr. do you want to add anything? Thank you so much. Yes, um, really great questions there. I'll just try and say three things really quickly. So on um, nature um, and moving away from a kind of language that just assumes that, that humans are the priority, I would love to talk a lot about more about multi-species justice and ecofeminism, but uh, to keep it short, there's a huge amount that we could learn from indigenous communities who live in a way that is respectful of, of the, the non-human world around us and recognises that we're part of that, and, and that is going to be a key part of any way forward. Um, briefly on um, Just Stop Oil, I mean, I think we're at a situation where they are showing completely legitimate civil disobedience. The government has failed to do its part of looking, up, of keeping up whatever implicit contract we have, protecting the future of younger generations, and they are using the means that they can, just as the suffragettes did, just as the civil rights movement did, to say that this is not acceptable. And I think that, that they are doing what's right. And um, on... Um, the final, on, on the point that was made at the back, yes, I think it's key to, to recognise, at the one hand, the absolutely crucial importance of listening to and being led by the frontline communities, those who are already having to adapt to climate change, without just leaving it to them to, to become resilient on their own. This has to be about providing the resources, sharing the technology, but also listening and giving a genuine seat at the decision-making table to the people who are most affected. Thank you. Julina, do you want to add um, Just based uh, on what you were saying, I think, yeah, we had four minutes to talk, and it's very difficult to touch upon the nature. We can go on and on. There is a deforestation I wanted to touch upon. There's, you know, the issues with the bees at the moment that people have been talking about and still not found a solution. And without pollination, people don't actually realise that we'll have no crops. And that's a big thing, and that's a huge topic in itself. So I would have loved to touch upon that as well. Um, and then the meat, the consumption of meat, do we start to dictate to people you can't eat meat. You know, this is a, you know, you've got to think about humans like people's rights and uh, how much are we going to become, you know, we have to educate and explain to allow people to start, um, to start understanding. And I believe in, I think the global taxes that Ben touched upon is something that uh, could uh, assist with that. Um, I think everything's already been said, so I'm not going to reiterate what's been already said by the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, we're running uh, out of time and uh, uh, I, I know uh, we could have gone on for another hour easily. I'm just going to take a last question. I can see you had your hand up uh, for a very long time. Uh, very briefly, please. Uh. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm also an activist for Fridays for Future and Just a Poil or This Is Wrecked, as it's called. And um, I want to know what your thoughts are on um, young people using their right to protest, as we're seeing now that the government is taking more extreme measures using Section 12 and 14, um, making it more and more difficult for young people to be able to do this. And um, sorry. Uh, so uh, how do you think that we would be able to let the government hear what we want and get them to actually listen to us instead of them just ignoring us and making it more and more difficult? <laughs> Thank you. Jelena, she's the lawyer. Very so simple. I'm just going to leave it to you. 
everyone has a freedom of speech and you have a right to uh, have a freedom to protest and um, it's uh, to an extent of course no violence no you know peaceful protests are being done and I think that the government are stepping in and it's for us again going back to the lobbyists to have the acts amended so that it allows peaceful protests to carry on because you have a right to protest it's your freedom of speech and you should have a right to protest and I completely agree with it yes so carry on <laughs> thank you thank you very much uh, I'm really uh, sorry if I, if you, uh, if I haven't given, uh, managed to give you the time. As I said, that time is very tight. But uh, as I said at the beginning, and I'm saying it now, we are here to listen. And uh, if, if you have any questions, uh, you can write to me. You can write to any of my colleagues. Uh, and I will make sure that we do respond uh, to your emails. Uh, uh, and uh, we are committed. Uh, that's why we're here as the panelists and everyone, the voice from all of us, is that we need to work together. Uh, we have to work together. Uh, it's uh, five year, four year, it's not the plan for uh, any time limit. It's happening. We can see it all over the world. We can see uh, the fire, we can see the water, we can see the floods. We, uh, the things are happening everywhere. So we need to take the action. So before I finish, uh, I'm going to ask all my panelists very shortly. I don't know if we'd, she'll have uh, Dr. Hawk uh, uh, online. Uh, uh, that saved us a minute. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to start from Jelena uh, and then I'll uh, just to summarize or uh, very briefly. Uh, uh, um, climate change is a global phenomena and we created it so we need to resolve it now it is our duty to do it for the future of our children and um, it can only be done collectively this is a global issue there is no dignity in a slow painful death doctor yes I mean this is about basic justice. This, we strip away all the political discussions and party politics. This is about whether it's acceptable to live in a way which is destroying the lives of our fellow human beings, including our own children and grandchildren. And I think when we, we step back and look at it that simply, it becomes clear that we have a, an imperative to act and act now on this. Um, the loss and damage fund, which you've heard a lot about uh, today, would, I don't think, have been established when it was, if it wasn't for the efforts of the people of Scotland. It was campaigners in Scotland putting pressure on the Scottish Government initially to champion this issue, which they then did, and then that led to progress at COP27. So I think that that story should give people a lot of hope, actually, that with collective activism um, and a small scale in a country like Scotland, that big change can happen. Thank you. Thank you to all my panelists. Uh, all of you have been excellent, and of course, uh, it would have been possible if all of you uh, have, have you know, has been here or contributed. Uh, thanks to the, the the staff who has been uh, working and putting up with us. Thank you all uh, again. Uh, just before I end, uh, I'll tell you that there's events are happening. Uh, today, tomorrow on, and Friday uh, and uh, as my colleague said that uh, uh, she will be chairing uh, on Friday uh, Scotland a global, uh, a good global citizen uh, uh, and there is a workers right so if you can pick up the leaflets I think they're, they're outside uh, you'll see uh, there's lots of events are happening Scottish Parliament is yours uh, all the parliamentarians are elected by you all we are here to listen to you. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's impossible uh, to answer all the questions uh, at one go, but we are trying our level best. And we all need to, as I said, we all need to work together. We are here to listen, and we're listening. Thank you very much. And thank you, panelists, again. Thank you very much. Thank you.